Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for Game Blood Radio. What up, what up, everybody? This is Double G for FGB Radio. We are back. I don't know if we're going to start recording um, consistently, but from time to time, we are going to be able to get back together, and, and tonight is one of those nights. And I don't have Jason with me, but someone I do have, he's like a little brother from another mother, but he hates it when I call him or I describe him as a little brother. Big D, what's up? Treat me like a little brother. <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> Um, nothing much, uh, tonight, it's, it's a very, uh, it's sort of like the calm before the storm, because WWE's Battleground is this weekend, and we're gonna talk about that show, preview all the matches, at least the ones that we know, I kind of have a feeling they're gonna add a couple. They Uh, did. Well, they haven't, I mean, they've added, there's one match in particular that hasn't been added officially to either WWE's uh, website or Wikipedia. So right now I only show six matches plus the kickoff, but we can get into what we think that they're going to add. Uh, I'm assuming Bray Wyatt is going to face Kofi or something of that nature, but that has not yet been officially added to the card. It might be added the day of. That seems to be the new trend now. So. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, before or after after this like we are we are dead like in boxing and and MMA world uh for the next few months so this is kind of a, a tame week but it's going to get kicked into gear pretty quickly so I'm sure we'll have more to talk about when we do get a chance I hope to have uh Duan on sometime next week to talk about Timothy Bradley and uh, Juan Manuel Marquez so that's going to be pretty cool uh, to talk to him again we haven't talked since the Mayweather uh, versus Canelo fight. So hope to do that next week. Crossing my fingers, I can uh, hook up with his schedule because our time zones are, are quite different. But let's and let's. The King of the Ring is coming to an end too. Yeah, the King of the Ring, King of All Kings tournament that we've been slowly but surely doing is in the semifinals. So we'll have three more posts about that and 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 get the king. Do you have a prediction right now? So yeah, I think I think Steve Austin is going to win. All right, so the last four are Brock Lesnar, Owen Hart, which is a bit of a surprise, Bret Hart, and Stone Cold. So out of those four guys, we will determine who the finals are. And From the beginning of this tournament, I predicted Brock and Stone Cold. That may happen, but we have a lot of Bret Hart fans as well. So Bret Hart could very, very well um, uh, upset Stone Cold. I actually, you wouldn't even call it an upset. But, of uh, course not. He, he always beats Stone Cold every time they wrestle. <laughs> every time. <laughs> Except for the one when Austin beat him by DQ. <laughs> you know, in the pay-per-view. All right, so um, we have a quick announcement before we get to this Battleground preview. The announcement is is that for those of you who, are, who have been listening to our WrestleMania 30 for 30 project, we have gone through WrestleManias 1 through 13, and 14 is set to be... Uh, Posted sometime next week, I believe. Uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're right. Next week. And, it was supposed to be this week, but I postponed it a week. And there, there's been a change in the team. Uh, Big D has been hosting, and myself and Dirty White Boy Jason have been uh, his co-hosts for this for this uh, project. Jason has uh, had to pull out because, frankly, he just has other projects in his life that are that are uh, making it hard for all of us to get together to record. I think, you know, when we first got scheduled to do this, you know, you sacrifice your schedule, I sacrifice my schedule, Jason sacrificed his schedule, and there are just uh sometimes things happen. He's got a project going that is actually going is actually a, a television project uh in in his hometown. So He's producing a football uh, show. I believe it's a football preview show or something. So he's doing the producing and the writing and the starring. So that's taking up a lot of his time. He's also, you know, still has his job to do. So that's sort of what he's uh, going to be doing for the, you know, for the near future. So instead of put the project on hold, uh, you know, D went out and looked for a replacement. And uh, well, that's, I didn't really look for it. It kind of fell into my lap. It fell into your, <laughs> it fell into your lap. 
But, uh, you know, I am very close to Jason, and I know you like Jason a lot, and I wanted to make sure that we had his blessing to move on, and he was very... Uh, he was very bummed out that he couldn't do it. Um, he, I know it was stressing him out because he knew that the project sort of relied on him at this point. And he's very thankful that uh, someone was able to step in, though still bothered that he couldn't finish. And uh, that person is someone who we both know very well. You know him a lot better than I do. But um, I'll let you introduce him. But I just want to say one thing uh, about the first 14 shows because 15 through 30 – if it works out, will be uh, yeah, yeah. The the person who I got is only is only contractually obligated to do fifteen right now with a with an optional extension to do thirty. That's the way it's the way I'm going to word it. All right. So uh, just want one thing to Jason uh, that uh, you know I, I I really like doing it with Jason as I like recorded. He and I have a, a pretty good chemistry, much like you and I do, because I've recorded tons of of uh, shows with both of you separately. And bringing the three of us together was a lot of fun. I could sort of tell when you were going to go a certain way, and I could tell when he was going to go a certain way. So I relied a lot of what I was doing based on the chemistry that I had with both of you. And so I thought that was uh, that was pretty fun. And uh, I, I know the person that you have brought in to, to help us out is going to be uh, really good, and I'm very excited to to work with him. So... Before uh, I go for it now, just introduce who is the replacement host and who hopefully will be helping us finish the rest of these shows out. Well, uh, I just wanted to say, just a side note, is I am very bummed out about the Jason thing because I felt that, and this is just kind of me being candid, I felt that it was a great team as far as what everybody brought to the table um, because I felt like kind of you had three, because we're, we're all different ages. I mean, we're not that different, but we, we, we had three people who had different, kind of grew up somewhat different um, as far as like, you know, the kind of wrestling that you were exposed to young. You know, you caught the 80s boom. I caught the late 80s kind of, it wasn't dead, but it was getting there. And then Jason caught the 90s dead, but it got better era. So yeah, about, about I would say what, about four years apart um, as far as when we started. Actually, I think it is about four years for each of us, maybe about five for you. And not to mention that Jason also was was good because I was kind of more out there. I was kind of the more kind of wacky kind of mark kind of thing, which is, which is what I want. I, I can't have a show with a serious guy and a serious guy. And then you were the whole journalist, um, you know, research diligently, um, very straight and narrow uh, kind of person. And then Jason was a combination because Jason, you know, like you mentioned the TV thing, he's getting into journalism, but he's also still a young guy, so he's still got that mark in him. So I thought it was a good mix, but the guy who's replacing him uh, has ac- is actually not really too experienced in podcasting. His cousin is, but he's not. Um, but he brings a lot to the table. His name's Brandon Draven, and he's going to bring a lot of uh, knowledge about professional wrestling, um, extensive wrestling collection, extensive observer collection. <clears throat> Just a student of the game. Um, he's a lot like me. We've spent, you know, hours and hours and hours talking about pro wrestling, which is really, really, really gay, but whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be exciting, and I, I promise that the quality of the show will remain high or maybe even go higher. I mean, this is not against Jason, but this guy knows a lot of stuff, and he's going to bring in some facts that I don't even remember. Um you know, so, and, he, and he also watched television very recently, so uh, he's, it's still fresh in his mind. So I'm excited about it. I really am. Um, and it's just going to be weird because, like, the first 14 have one guy, and then all of a sudden. And I really didn't want to change the lineup. You know, there were a lot of people who, uh, and I want to say this right now because I think it should be said. There was a lot of people who asked to be on these shows when when they started hearing, oh, let me be on WrestleMania 10 because, you know, it was my first show, or let me be on this one because I was there. And I had to tell them no because I didn't want to sacrifice the integrity of the show. Not in a bad way. More so, I wanted to keep it exactly the same all the way through. And when you bring in other guests, I mean, it, it, it makes the show kind of, you know, you know, it's, 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 it's out of, I guess, not really symmetrical. And not to mention that if we had four people on the show, it would have been like a five-hour show or more 
when you have that many people. So if anybody's listening to this, right, and you are um, one of the people who contacted me about being on the show, okay, please do not take this personal. Um, Draven, he, it wasn't like I actually sought him out. We were actually going to take a hiatus originally and not even do any shows till January when football season was over. Um, that was the plan. That was the plan for a little while. And Draven just kind of volunteered uh, in a way. And, uh, and I said, yeah, that would be great. And that's really, it, it kind of fell into my lap. So I don't want anybody listening to think, you know, that I am like purposely, you know, that, oh, well, this guy's better than me, so on and so forth. That, don't, don't think that is what I'm trying to say. I, so. I'm, gl- I'm glad I did not say who it was because I didn't know we were uh, using kayfabe names. But um, That's he, his real name. What are you talking about? <laughs> but he was also someone who – you know, you had in mind at the beginning before you even knew what was going on, and you know, for whatever reason, you know, we we created the team that we had. So, he, but he's been super interested in this from the beginning, and he's I know he's been listening, and I know he's been critiquing. Um, but yeah, <laughs> but uh, but no, I you know I I, I enjoy him. I, I've I uh, actually I've actually met him in person. Which have you you've met him in person? Yes. And that was for a WrestleMania uh, twenty eight. Twenty eight. Okay, Miami. So yeah, we had a, we had we were gonna have a couple beers with Sabu. Sabu was uh, my God, he looked terrible that day. But um, this guy, Sabu looked. Uh, first of all, he looked like he was a thousand years old. Second of all, <laughs> this guy was wearing a Hawaiian shirt, but like an open Hawaiian shirt, and and like and with his chest out. And it's not like he's freaking, you know, the situation or whatever. He's he's doing the thing, but he's got scars all over his body. He's wrinkled up and. He, he he was had this weird smile, so you can definitely tell. Well, I can't say definitely, but I assume that he was on the gimmicks. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah, no, I think he'll be a good addition, and um, I'm gonna be surrounded by Mexicans. So there you go. Yeah. So uh, we will. So the 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 next one that comes out will be 14. Jason is still on that one, but the 15, which will come out a couple weeks after that will be the pairing uh, of us. And, you know, the other thing about doing podcast is I think really doing it one-on-one is best because you don't have to worry about the other person stepping in or you stepping on somebody's uh, words. And that's why I think, you know, just having the chemistry that I have with you and having the chemistry that I have with Jason, we didn't really do that because I I knew the pauses and I and I could sort of read where you were going. I could read where he was going. In most cases, I just let him go first. Um, and so doing it with three people when you have the right uh, chemistry, I, it, it's not hard. Doing it with four would be ridiculous. Like it's it's really hard to do it with more than three people, and especially you know bringing in new folks from week to week. So unless it was. Uh, Steve Allen and Boris Zukov and Nikolai Volkov, I would have been, you know, I, I would have rather just kept it the three of us. So, and, and and that's a great. No, I agree. And that's it. Reminds me of okay. And this is not a diss. Okay, I'm gonna say something. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, this is, you know where this is going. This is not a diss. So don't take it this way. But I'll never forget, like five, four years ago, our our buddy Esteban, Steve Juwan. He booked a uh, an Angry Marks podcast with like five people to preview UFC, and two of them were Chess Army and Quintastic One, who had never seen UFC ever. And he he called me up and he's like, "Bro, he booked me on this show, but I don't watch UFC." <laughs> I'm like, "Well, then tell him you don't watch UFC, dude. Like, tell him, you know. I guess he assumes that you watched it. I mean, I would have done a little more research." And he's like. No, I'll just do the show. So then, like, when he's on the show, and I forgot what episode it was, he, like, literally, like, he basically bullshitted his way through the entire show. Like, like when somebody asked him about, like, I don't know, let's just Frank Mir, he would say, yeah, he's uh, he's good at submissions. The guy's never even seen a Frank Mir fight before. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so that just goes to show people, do your research before you, you, you do this, you know, and less people, the better. Yeah, no, I, I very much agree. So... Um, yeah, so I'm very, very much looking, uh, looking forward to doing that. Getting back on the train, you know, we've been off for a little bit. We, the, you know, to sort of let the uh, off the wagon like Jake. Well, let the people know kind of how we do this. We like to have a couple in, as they say, in the can because then, uh, you know, 
we can we can have them out there and 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 we'll never get behind really if scheduling you know problems happen but uh so we've actually been off for several weeks now so it's going to be good to get back into the swing of things um it it almost like you know the first 14 shows though you know if you think about how long we've been recording cuz each show is you know between 2 and 4 hours it's probably been like 40 hours of actual audio that we've recorded and yet it's it went by pretty quickly so it just shows you how much we enjoy doing this and and you know we still have 16 more shows to go um fi- you know 15 shows and then after WrestleMania 30 which is in April then we'll have to do sort of the you know the follow up to that um as the 30th and in 30 one. years so yes so uh so yeah 30 for 30 phase 2 that's going to be WrestleMania 16 you'll be like 90 years old Mm, not quite 90, but I'll probably feel 90. Um, right. All right, so no, you'll, I think you'll like Draven because um, Draven's kind of like Dave Meltzer in that if you ask him about something that he knows about, he's going to go off on his little tangent. For I mean, he's not going to go off and make the show long, but he will just kind of do everything from the dome. So um, so it, it's very Dave Meltzerish, except much, much more Mexican. <laughs> well, uh, Meltzer's not Mexican at all. <laughs> Yeah, but he's friends with Conan, so mm. that's close enough. Conan's, Conan's not, not Mexican, Mexican either. either. <laughs> but he's yeah, but he's an honorary Mexican. Wow. Um, okay, so uh, you know, I did ask Dave about Conan, and he didn't really say much. He just said that uh, Conan is a very intense boxing fan, someone who watches the, the the boxing very intensely. But he had problems scoring the fight; like he couldn't decide on the closer round, so he just gave everything that was close 10-10, <laughs> which is kind of funny. That's um, weird, because I, I didn't see that at all. But he used to be a boxer, so I guess that's why. Yeah, we should talk about your little date with Dave Meltzer. That should be that should be the, the, the hook for the show. Well, you know, I, I am... Uh, what you're alluding to is I went to a, uh indie show, actually, in Gilroy, California, which is the city that I live in. And I... I mean, I'm sure they've done shows near here, like the the Conan show, the Lucha Libre Conan show that that happened a few weeks before that, that he actually worked, was in Watsonville, which is, you know, 20 to 30 miles from here. But in actual Gilroy, like, I think that, you know, they've only done a couple shows. So the the group is called Premier Wrestle, or Premier, I think it's just called Premier. Their, their, their Twitter handle is at Premier Wrestle. Um, and I had been in contact with Dave because I was going to go to the first one and I know he went and I didn't get a chance to go and then when the set you know they they plan these things out you know several months in advance so we we sort of knew a date uh, and uh you know when I asked Dave before I sent him an email you know seeing if he was going to go he wanted to get a group of people together so I told him you know I said you know I'll put something on the board no no one really bought, bought uh, or bit on the on the board but uh, I had three friends. Uh, one of them wasn't would, uh, didn't show up actually. But and then he brought a couple of his friends. So there was you know there was like six of us or so that that were hanging out and, and watching the show. And the thing is, is that he has a broken foot, so he is unable to drive. Um, so I went out of my way to go get him and his buddies just so that he didn't have to worry about you know how to get in and get and get back home and stuff. And you know for me. Like when someone, when someone says, you know, well, gosh, why would you go drive to San Jose? And it's like, well, I mean, if you had a chance to... Uh, you met Dave Meltzer's family, dude. That's worth it to me. <laughs> well, it wasn't even that. Like, that, like that's cool and stuff because, you know, he's a nice person. But more so, like, let's say that you had a, you know, and, and let, let's bring Draven into this because he's a huge movie fan. If he had a chance to, uh, you know, sit in a car... And talk with a you know a specific movie director that that he Quite really enjoyed. If, let, right, that's what I was thinking of. You know, for for an hour, uh, just sit and chat with him. Like he'd probably drive you know multiple miles to go sit and go do that. So that's kind of how I looked at it. Like, oh, you know, I could just get to talk wrestling and MMA with you know with Dave for for X number of uh, of minutes. And so that you know that that was main the whole thing. The, the good thing about it was the show was great. Um, they they actually have a very uh, a very, I would say, it, it it's sort of uh, like a, like an MMA uh, 
production in, in a sense in in the way that they do their interviews and the way that they present so MMA presentation and the the wrestling is actually very serious style there was uh there was one heel on the whole show his name is the Almighty Sheik um, Oh it's uh really Yeah I know that guy it's Joey Machete Oh is that who he is Yeah he used to work um no I really know that guy he used to work down here in um Florida and for some, it's weird, man. So he worked as Joey Machete in this tag team called Black Market, and then in 2000, I want to say seven, he comes up with this Almighty Sheik gimmick, and he basically portrayed that character, which is weird because he was never really the Sheik before. That he all of a sudden wanted to be the Sheik. <laughs> and it's weird. And then his tag team partner, who's this big giant guy, um, I don't remember his name actually, but he. Uh, uh, he was just giant. I mean, this guy was massive, dude, like Vader size. I think he quit the business. But Joey Machete is interesting because he did this Almighty Sheik character, and, like, it got him over. He actually got an article in the Orlando Sentinel because of that gimmick. And he won, I think he was actually he won some indie titles and things like that. But it's weird because he's one of those guys, and this is kind of interesting to, to think about. He's one of those indie guys who is kind of like a Brian Danielson, kind of like a CM Punk, where they would work all the different territories, uh -huh. um, the indie ones, but they'd work the smaller ones. But this guy, like, nobody even knows who this guy is, man. That's a, that's what's weird about it. Um, but you're saying he was the only heel? Yeah. Uh, and he was, the, he was the only gimmick, really, on the show. Like, you know, there were, there were guys who were dressed up looking sort of like characters, uh, but... You know, when it came down to like how they worked, like they worked pretty seriously, um, and you know the, the the whole the whole idea for this show was like just it was just it, like it was interesting because like you know how sometimes you watch a WWE show and you go wow you know this thing would be a lot better if it was two hours instead of three hours, and this show was just over two hours and yet it Perfect. felt. It felt like the perfect time because I, I was, uh, you know, I was sitting there and I was kind of like, you know, checking out my watch and just seeing, you know, what, what is the, uh, you know, what what's the time here? Like how much time is left? And, you know, at the, you know, right as the main event hit, I was like, you know what? Like this is the perfect time. And the main event hit at like, you know, maybe an hour 45 or something. So it, it, it's, it's presented in, in like an MMA style where guys, you know, they come into the ring. They're announced separately uh, after the match. You know, they, there's an interview with the winner. The, the referee is in the middle of the ring, raises uh, the winner's hand. The loser is very frustrated and bummed out. And the reason is is because – they they do rankings and and your record matters and thus you know logically like how it should work if you win you are that much closer to a title shot and if you lose you are that much further away and so uh, you know Fat Gabe tried that a couple of years ago and then <laughs> Fat Gabe tried that with uh, Evolve and then what happened was all his guys got signed <laughs> so much for that so your your championship contenders were like zero and one it was like fucking Strike Force. <laughs> terrible um it's hard to do that it really is no and you know he, he uh, the 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 booker uh is someone who's uh who, who who i've been chatting with on on facebook for a little while his name is uh, john LaRocca, and he uh booked in apw for a few years i guess from uh for four years from 08 to 2012 and then he created premiere and uh really like you know, we'll chit chat. And, you know, he re I think he reached out to me because he knew I was from the area, and uh, he I, I'm friends with somebody who he's friends with. So I'm so he probably saw that I was you know I had posted something about wrestling or whatever. But uh, he so we've been we've been chatting, and then I you know just as the show got closer, uh, you know he I was just asking him questions about the show and stuff. So the uh, the. I, I guess I would say the most impressive part of the show was the athleticism with some of the main guys uh, was just much more impressive than I expected. Their champion. And they were good for indie guys, what are you trying to say? They were good for any sort of wrestling. Like, uh, like I looked at some of these guys and thought, you know, if. 
you know, maybe if they had a little bit more size or whatever, like they 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 were able to like the the champion is uh, Jeff Cobb and he's a former uh, 2004 Olympian. Wow! And, and he was doing some crazy athletic stuff. His finish. He'll probably get signed, dude. Let's be real. In well, a couple of years, he might get signed. Well, the only problem is, is he's not big. Like he, I, I, I stood next to him. I, I was probably his height. I, you know, I would say that we were probably the same height. But he's, he's just. Taller than, he's taller than the current uh, top baby face. Then. Yes, he is. He, but he, yeah. but he was so strong. He did this move where it was his finisher, and uh, he has this uh, on YouTube. He has like the ten, his ten best moves or whatever, and they're all like ridiculous. But he does this move where he picked up the guy uh, who he was facing, Brian Tannen, uh, who I, I think he's named after the uh, the uh, Back to the Future character, Biff Tannen. Um, yeah. And and so he picks he picks him up, and this dude Brian Tannen is probably like I don't know. 260 between 260 and 280 and he's just a powerhouse guy like he's a huge bench press guy and so he picks him up in a body slam and instead of going with the momentum you know you pick someone up for a body slam you kind of throw him over your right shoulder a little bit and then you slam he picks him up throws him over his right shoulder but then his momentum has his momentum carry him the reverse direction and he power slams him sort of like in a reverse direction, which – It sounds like a backwards F5. It was sort of like that, but it was just ridiculous. Like I, I was surprised that he could actually get him up. You know, Not that he could actually get him up because he, he went up – he got him up fairly fairly easily. But just you know, the momentum to slam him, he was actually moving against gravity and spun the opposite way and slammed him the opposite way. And I just thought that was, that was ridiculous. He also does a uh, – he also does a um, – what was the other move that he did? It was a – You know what, though? You're making me feel good because it, 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 I'm happy that there's talent out there who is yet to – to use a core Bauer word, cultivated. There's a lot of uncultivated talent because that guy sounds like he's legit. That guy sounds like it's somebody who, from the way you're describing it, who does have a future, even though he might not be that tall. If he's jacked like a, you know, like a train and he can do these kind of moves, I mean, it sounds like – he could end up, you know, having a future. Well, I, you know, I'd hope so. And, and you know, based on what Premier does, you know, they, he could use, you know, he can continue working there. He, I, I know he also works probably around the Bay Area. Um, I think he also worked in Hawaii. Uh, but uh, he did he did the, 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 the British Bulldog delayed vertical suplex, and he also did a standing shooting star. But when he won the title in the, I think it was the show before, he, he did a shooting star from the top rope. So just super athletic. Uh, and the other thing is just the guys are really, they're really tight. Like, you know, because there's not that many people there, so I was right in the front row. I could see everything. And so, you know, this is your first indie show, right? In like years and years and years. Yeah, it's been a long. I, I've been to a couple, but this has been like that. You know, that was much longer. Uh, a yeah, long time ago. this is Dave's. This is Dave's first pro wrestling show. I want to say in about four years. There was what's that SmackDown. Yeah, I, I didn't even ask him. Actually, no, he I, went I, to the he went to the premiere show, the one before this that I missed. So he this is the second one. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I it was just you know that they. I was close, so I could, you know, I could see if stuff was sloppy or if stuff was missing. And there were a couple matches where, you know, they were trying to do stuff that you're like, ah, you know, that guy screwed up. But, but the, they were able to counter pretty logically, uh, and 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 you know, and smartly if you were to like to counter something like that in, in, in like an MMA fight or a real fight or whatever. But um, yeah, so the 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 work was really tight. The work was strong. It was hard hitting. It was, uh, I guess, it was sort of like uh, how what is the the UWF which, which they portrayed the wrestling as real, even though it was just a strong style, really snug yeah, style. Japan. Yeah, that's what Dave compared it to. Though I, I've never really seen any UWF tapes, so I couldn't tell you if that's what it was. But that's what Meltzer yeah, compared it to. I got some if you want some. Not tapes, but 
I got the first show with Takata versus Vader. And no, that's what it was. It was all submissions. And they had some, you know, it's funny at UWFI, they had some funny rules. The rules for UWF were the most unique rules of any pro wrestling company, you know, because um, it wasn't like a pinfall. You had to, basically, you started with 15 points, and every time you hit like a suplex, you'd go down three points. So you go down. Very interesting rules. Um, very unique rules. Uh, in fact, some people would think it's stupid, but I like them. So, the, I like the rules. And to sort of circle this right back to Conan is Jeff Cobb, who's the champ, went to Conan's seminar that he held in San Jose a couple weeks ago. And Meltzer said that Conan was really impressed with Cobb. And then was talking to Cobb about it. He basically said, like, hey, he's like, yeah, it was kind of cool because, you know, I'm getting critiqued by Conan. And when he gives you any information, you're just like, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. So he, you know, he really was impressed by Conan. And uh, it sounded like Conan liked him a lot. So, you know, maybe, maybe something down the line happens with that Lucha promotion. Triple A and, USA. And he brings him in. <laughs> So let's talk about the good shit, though. Okay, did you see or speak to or okay? Did you see a photograph of the great Scotty Meltzer? That's what I want to know. I didn't. I, I, I when I picked Dave up, I it didn't sound like I hung out at his house very very long. But when you have uh, when you walk into the house, there's like a it's sort of like a a, a photo collage that's hanging on the wall. Which is, it looks like just pictures of wrestlers and then feedback that those wrestlers have sent in to Dave. Almost like it was like a uh, a birthday present. Like, I, I don't know if that is the case, but it was like, there's a picture of Bill Goldberg. And then there's a, like a quote from Goldberg saying, you know, something to Dave, you know. Thanks for blah, 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 blah. So that's the one with Brock that says that was a stupid question. (laughs) You know, I I didn't I didn't notice if Brock was on there or not. But that's the first thing. Um, And then, you know, just there was nothing much else. We we, we had to get going. So it's not like I could hang out that that much. But very nice home. Very nice family. Um, And And you got to meet the future Cody Meltzer. I did. I did get to see his son. I got to see his daughter, too. They, uh, you know, they were just normal kids <laughs> just kind of said hi and you know dig went them out and d- to do their thing um, but cody's running the observer after dave retires right uh, i don't i don't think dave's retiring now okay now this is what's interesting this is what interests me so you saw the tape collection but you didn't get to watch any tapes and they're all un- unlabeled no i didn't see anything his, his wife just mentioned but his that, wife told you that's that right. there was just a bunch of them and that they were unlabeled I would have loved to have seen the tape collection because I mean I, I just assume that it's like four hundred tapes. Well, there's the video, right? We we saw the YouTube video. Yeah, but I mean, like, yeah, but it's different when you're there. You know what I mean? Because you can actually, like, you know, you have that three dimensional. You can actually see stuff. You know, and yeah, that's that's funny. That's that's interesting. Um. Yeah, but it was overall really really fun. You know, got to talk about a lot of interesting things when when you. Uh, you know when you when you ha- when you get to talk to somebody who's such an expert and such a fan and such a follower you know he, the guy the guy lives breathes and and eats all of it wrestling MMA and so he's so knowledgeable and it's almost like any question you have you know you go back you, you know he has something but you know the other thing is he likes to get feedback you know just sort of to see what other people think and so we, you know we, he would ask us certain things or you know, we we would all get in a discussion. I for, I forgot the the one that I was thinking of. Oh, it was the uh, we were all talking about the raw from the uh, last not 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 the uh, not the raw from this week, but the previous raw, which was the Shield versus uh, what was it, eleven Love baby faces. <laughs> and, yeah. and so we talked about that and just the, you know the the how unlogical or how illogical that was, and just you know that kind of stuff. So. Uh, but overall, good good time. Um, so before uh, before we 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 sort of uh, you know get out of our, our our own way here, let's talk about Battleground because this show I would say is the second really unimpressive card that they've put together, pay per view card uh, in a row. And I felt after after SummerSlam that there was a certain High I would, interest. Well, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't say hot, but I would say that high interest is right. 
Um, but there's a there was a buzz, a little buzz about what they were going to do at that moment. And so then, you know, since SummerSlam, I don't know how many weeks there's been since then, probably six six weeks or so. And now we have Battleground, which is no, actually it's been like nine weeks. Has it been? Cause, yeah, because remember it was like it was five weeks. Well, actually, yeah, yeah, nine weeks because it's it's three weeks for the last one, then four after that. So yeah, it, no, it's seven. I'm sorry, seven weeks. Seven okay. weeks. All right. So we have for the second pay per view in a row, Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton in a. I, I thought they had to, you know, I thought they they were kind of booked into a corner at the last show, and they dusty finished their way out of it, and now they're sort of booked in a corner uh, with this show. But that's really the only match that um, that has that intrigue. And I would say if there was a second match of intrigue, it's not even CM Punk and Ryback or RVD and Alberto. Hell no. It's the Shield against uh, Cody and Dustin. Actually, I'm more interested in that match than I am the main event. I, I, I would have to. I would definitely agree with that. I think that was the only match that was even that's even really been pushed as interesting in the last two weeks. Um, so actually let, let's just look at the card and, and, you know, I was thinking about something before we started talking, the, uh, the ratings are down fairly significantly. Now, some of that has to do with the NFL, but the NFL always comes and, you know, I, th- my, my, my guess is that WWE expected to take a little bit of a hit because John Cena is gone and he's kind of their their one ratings mover. Uh, CM Punk is probably two. Brock is in there when he's around. Rock's obviously in there. But well, didn't Punk kill his his ratings um, uh, moving ability last year when he did that Jerry Lawler thing? Remember Dave? We thought was talking about that, and, and they said that after that, Punk's uh, every time he was on TV, they would lose viewers for like a few weeks there. Well, I think. I think they've booked him in a way, especially with Heyman, where I think they definitely gain when, when in his segments. But they, I mean, they're they, they're smart about it, right? Like he's treated like a star, and usually when you when you have those segments that you know that are at the top of the hour or whatever that feel important, like those things are going to gain. Um, I, I I so in a sense, it's like Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton as the top two guys is 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 a bit of a breath of fresh air. In a sense, you know, there's a lot of people who don't like John Cena. A lot of people who are tired of him. I, I am actually not. I, I enjoy him for the most part, but I do feel like his injury has allowed them to push somebody else in that top babyface spot, Daniel Bryan. But at the same time, with the ratings down, you sort of have to wonder, you know, how much patience they're going to have with with Brian in that top slot. It's not like there's anybody really there to take that away from him. They're not going to blame Huntor, the creative. They're going to blame him, which I kind of expected. Well, I mean, I I would imagine so. You know, I I would think that they would. But uh, I I, I appreciate the long-term idea that they have, which, you know, I guess is going to go to WrestleMania with this, you know, Triple H thing. Um, but you have to wonder, you know, how long are they going to be patient? What if ratings go down even further? You know, what are they going to do? They're going to have, they're going to start hot shotting something. You know, do they rush Cena back? I, I would hope that the, uh, the payoff, they have faith in, in their idea and, and they kind of stay the course. But at some point you got to wonder, you know, when do you stop the slide? And, uh, the thing that would actually give me a little bit of confidence in their long-term planning is that they would have exciting pay-per-views. And I skipped the last one, which was the United Champions. Which was a good idea because that show sucked. <laughs> and I'm going to have to skip this one as well because uh, Niners are playing. And you know, if I hear that it's good, I'll seek it out and try to find it and try to get, it, get a hold of it. If I hear that it's not good, you know, I probably won't. But do you feel like they have missed some opportunities here? Because, you know, I think people really wanted to see Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton, uh, you know, the first time. But really nothing underneath is developed at all. I mean, when you, when, one yes. of the, when one of the matches on your pay-per-view this week is uh, Curtis Axel and R-Truth, 
which was pretty much thrown together at the last minute. Like that's two not guys a, who I never want to see again for the rest of my life. And it's you know not pay per view quality. It just seems like that's a superstars match, dude. Fuck. Well, well Saturday it, morning slam. Is is it because they're so focused on this top angle? You know why? Why do you think that the depth is so bad right now? It's piss poor creative, and you brought up a good point. Actually, Draven and I spoke about this on the phone. Is that uh, this very thing? Uh, and I'm glad you you pointed it out. They they centered the entire company around the one angle. They've they've taken you know one um, you know the one angle and they've spread it out throughout the entire company. So you've got guys like Rob Van Dam involved. You've got the Big Show involved. You've got the Usos, right? And it's kind of like the whole. It's kinda, it's very similar to the NWO. Because when the NWO was around, they uh, they did that. They had several wrestlers and the corporation too, uh, in the in the Attitude Era. Several wrestlers, you know, who were on the mid card, kind of getting involved. And I like that. I actually do like that. The, the problem is that they always had another sort of mid card feud going, and or uh, several actually. Because if you think back to like '98. You know, in 98, you had the Wolf Pack, you had the Black and White, you had WCW, but you also had underneath coming up, you had Goldberg, you had the feud between Jericho and Dean Malenko, which was a very underrated undercard feud. Um, you also had the Booker T. Benoit Best of Seven series. This was all going on at the same time, the summer of 98. Um, and so it's one of those things where you can do that, but I think that they've completely kind of, I don't want to say they've gotten lazy, but I do think that that's what it is. I think that the creative is, frankly, to, to quote Steve Austin, the creative is piss poor. I mean, because what it is, is it's not that the booking is bad. Because a lot of marks have been complaining about this since Daniel Bryan lost at SummerSlam. It's that it's uncreative. That's what it is. Because logically, you want to get heat on Daniel Bryan or heat on Randy Orton, right? But when you have the shows end the same exact way for like five weeks in a row, where it's Randy Orton laying out Daniel Bryan, it's very, very repetitive. And it was on Raw and SmackDown. And to me, that's piss poor creative because the creative team or Triple H or whoever is in charge of coming up with these storylines, they don't even have quote unquote storylines because what's the story? And there's lots of different ways to screw over a baby face, lots of different ways as we've seen. And they've done the same thing over and over and over. And that's that to me is piss poor creative because they could come up with so many different angles and, and you know different ways to take this you know this feud but it's the same thing and if you look at the undercard the undercard is really really suffering like you said because there's no feuds there's no feuds i mean literally every quote unquote feud is exactly the same two guys wrestle on raw one guy wins other they wrestle again on smackdown other guy wins they wrestle on TV three or four more times. They trade wins, and they go on pay-per-view. That's literally every feud. The Rob Van Dam, Alberto Del Rio feud, what is that? Like, what is that feud? It's just them wrestling random non-title TV matches, getting wins on each other, and then they want us to pay to see it again. It's fucking stupid. And then another one is um, the whole Bray Wyatt thing. Like, oh, I didn't even know they were feuding. Like, is this even a feud? Like, it's like they have... It's so strange. It's like they literally have no feuds. And the Daniel Bryan, Randy Orton, so why would you vacate the belt if you're going to go back to the same match? I mean, I thought, you know, they were going to do a tournament, and, you know, and I thought they were going to kind of redo the Deadly Games thing where they were going to do a tournament, and they were going to have Triple H purposely kind of work Randy into the main event, you know, by screwing over the other guys that he was facing. Like, you know, they could have Randy's side of the bracket be like Randy versus Zack Ryder. Meanwhile, on on Daniel Bryan's side of the bracket, it's him and Ryback. You know, things like that where they could have kind of been real creative with how they screwed the guy over. But it's just been the same thing over and over again. And it's really, really tough to watch. It's not bad. It's just stale. It's very, very stale. And that's not a good thing. I would rather you go kind of wacky and stupid than go stale. Well, you just reminded me something that we talked about when we went out for dinner, and it was just wasn't only Dave and I, it was just all of us, Dave's friends, my friends. We talked about how to book the 
unification or whatever the title match is when you know when they stripped they stripped Orton of the title. Um, you know, how do you do that, and how do you you make Daniel Bryan winning the title? You know, be something super impressive because I mean, you could have him win the title. But then what do you do from there? Is he the well, fu- that's is he- what I'm saying. That's what happened at the last show. And here's the other scary part. That match that they had at that pay-per-view was not good. It, I mean, okay, it wasn't bad. It was just not great. It was like their worst match, and that's not a good sign. Well, how do you – you know, is he – Is he's not built to be a fighting babyface champion. Austin rarely ever lost on his way to winning the title. And thus, when he won the title, he was hot as, as, as ever. And, you know, then he, he took on, you know, all comers. But still, they had to get the title off of him, you know, not, not that too long after to, to build the, the run for the title again, you know, which happened at the following WrestleMania, which is what, what will, as, as uh, WrestleMania 30 for 30 kicks into gear, that's exactly what we'll be talking about. Um, so the idea was, you know, I, I asked Dave, I said, you know, do you think – doing some sort of tournament like Survivor Series 1998 where you stack the deck against Brian would have been That's smart. It. That's what I'm talking about. And what he said is he said, yeah, you know, you could have done that or you just stack the deck on TV every week and you make him win matches to get that title shot again. Well, that's that's what they what I thought they were gonna do, and they kind of did do it, but they didn't really do it the proper way. You know, the eleven versus three way is not a good idea. The eleven versus three match, not a good idea. Um, I like the fact that he's like wrestling the shield to earn his, himself. You know, the, the the shot. That's a good. That's a very good book chance. You got you got to give him credit when it's good. But there's only three guys in the shield, man. So it's like we need to bring in more guys. Like they need. It's almost as if what they should do, and they won't do it is they almost need to bring in somebody from the outside for a very short run and have them... Like, remember how the big boss man came in 98 and that was like Vince's enforcer for a little while? They need to bring in like another guy, an older guy, to come in for a very short time and kind of be Daniel Bryan's, um, you know, the thorn in his side. You know, it's kind of like you're building up to the, you know, like a video game. You know, in a, in a video game, you don't fight M. Bison until you fight the guy. You know, you don't fight... Mike Tyson until you fight uh, Mr. Sandman. So they could have brought like a Mr. Sandman to give Brian a side guy. You know, you know what? A really good example in ECW was 911. No, I'm sorry, not 9 Brian Lee. Uh, Tommy Dreamer was shooting with Raven, and they would feud, but Dreamer would always have to deal with 9 or well, with, uh, I would say 9 one with uh, Brian Lee. And Brian Lee would lay him out, and then he'd have to wrestle Brian Lee, and then he would, you know, it's basically Brian Lee is like the guy who he has to beat to get to to Raven. They could have done something like that, but they're doing it with the Shield. But like we talked about, it's the same thing every week. You know, it's Daniel Bryan the Gauntlet match. Daniel Bryan, you know, it's just they need somebody else to come in, maybe for a short run to be that sub boss, I guess. Um. Well, but there was one thing I, w- I was going to bring up, and now I totally forgot. I'm sure it'll come to me. So let's go. Uh, let's go to. Let's go to uh, the card. We're talking, we're talking about the booking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, you you had brought up a reference, and I was going to follow up with your reference, but I just forgot. Um, let, let's talk. Well, it's just, it, I just. I just one last thing. It's just one of those things where it's just. Um, it's not again. I, I haven't lost interest. Because I was really hyped after SummerSlam, as you know, we did the show. Um, but I think and it sucks because it's not like they bury Daniel Bryan or, you know, what the stupid retards would say. Sorry for saying that. Um, but he, he's not buried. It's just that the creative, the actual creativity, because remember, creative is coming up with stuff, is what creative, the word creative means. Their lack of being able to come up with fresh stuff, or even not, it doesn't have to be that fresh, even copy stuff that hasn't been done in a while has been very, very, um, I guess, lackluster, very below average. Uh, when you have talent like this and you have guys who are over, you really shouldn't be this lackluster. Okay, so let's look at the card. Curtis and Ax- I mean, Curtis and R-Truth, uh, Nobody really cares. I, I don't. Not a I don't. Single person on earth cares. I don't imagine Axel loses this title. I it, 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 not to our truth, at, at least. Um, our truth is 
barely, you know, he, he's he's very rarely on Raw as it is, and uh, I, I don't see that happening. So we, we don't even have to talk about that match. But here, well, here, I mean, I, I, let me ask you a question. I don't think Axel's got it, man. I mean, all due respect to the Henning family, he's probably number three as far as his dad and his grandfather go. You know, probably. His dad was, you know, I mean, he's one of the best ever, and his grandfather was a legitimate draw, um, right? He just doesn't have it, dude. I mean, I don't know how you feel, but I don't see stars when I see this guy, bro. I mean, he looks like a fucking geek. He's a geek, dude. I think... <sighs> the... I thought being with Heyman would help him. I don't think the booking has helped him very much. He's still very bland. Um, Nothing can help him, bro, when you're that much of a geek. This is a guy who's going to end up going to TNA and then cutting that. Of course, you know what promo he's going to cut. When I was up north, I couldn't be myself. I had to be Michael McGillicuddy and Curtis Axel. Well, my name is Joe Henning, and here at TNA, I'm going to be myself. Which every geek has fucking done, and it's meant nothing. I really am sick of that promo. Well, my, I really am. I, I guess my, my issue with Axel is that he hasn't done anything. Like, I've, you know, what ha, the, the where has the one wow moment been in this run? I haven't really seen it. He was book strong in, well, he sucks. in the early. I'm sorry, early but he sucks. Hey, Rock likes him. Who? That has to mean something. Who likes him? Rock. Well, yeah, cause he, of course he's gonna like him. He's the one who we train with. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, I mean, I'm sure the Rock likes. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure the Rock likes Paul Walker. Paul Walker's not gonna be on Raw drawing money anytime <laughs> soon. Um, yeah, you know, he he's definitely dropped the ball. I think uh, the, the the their uh, their inability to book strong characters. Is uh, is definitely a, a flaw. I think if he was brought up, you know, in a, in a different era where they were a lot stronger at introducing guys, maybe that helps him a little bit. Because I think his wrestling is fine. He just doesn't have that much of a personality. Um, but well, let, actually, I, I'm going to disagree with you. I think no matter where you bring him up, he's a geek. I'm sorry, but I just I can't buy him as being tough. He's got a stupid fucking face. He has no charisma. I just I'm, I'm sorry, but when I look at the guy, I think Jay Brown, and that's <laughs> and, and I don't care how good the creative is. I don't care if it's written by the guy who wrote Breaking Bad. That guy's not getting over, dude. He's, he's yeah, that guy's a mid Carter forever. Mm, I, th- I, th- my, I, th- I think I think in certain eras he could have been a lot stronger than he is. Just based on how they write him, like I don't, I don't think they understand. They, they, they seem to not understand. Uh, they, they're, they're fighting. I, I'll say this: they're fighting how to book the son of legends. They, you know, you see how they book Cody. Um, you know, we've seen in the past how they booked DiBiase. Randy's it, the best booked one. Yeah, Randy. Randy is, but that's also because you know Randy's been around for so long. And he's so damn great, but. They don't book the Sons of Legends very well right now. And, you know, whatever it is, whatever is holding back, you know, maybe these guys are in their father's shadows. Whatever it is, it's just not happening. But let's talk, well, he certainly is. Let's talk about Ziggler and Sandow and why the hell this is the kickoff match. I didn't even know that was happening. See, there you go. I did not even know that that was a match. So, I didn't even fucking know. So the, the, the trivial thing about this match is... You have Damian Sanda, who's the single worst Money in the Bank winner of all time, and then not 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 him as a wrestler being the worst. The way that they've followed up his character since he won the briefcase is the single worst character since the Money in the Bank. Since was. Dolph, that's what it is, <laughs> right? He's Dolph is the second worst. Well, Dolph is the second worst for sure, and then Dolph, who for whatever reason has just lost favor. With everybody, and you know, I, I would say I don't know, maybe a year ago at this point, he was kind of had a little bit of a buzz. We were waiting for him to, you know, to to unload that uh, that that briefcase, and then he had the 
the TLC match with Cena, and they actually put him over. Like, where's that? Like, that Dolph is, is long gone. Like, he's done something to somebody. He's talked too much. He's slept with the wrong person. There's something going on there, and it's unfortunate because he is still – uh, very good at, at at just about everything that that he does, but they just want him to lose matches and lose matches. So you have a battle of two super talented guys who are just not in the favor of of anybody. Well, you know what the irony is: Dolph is more like Kurt Henning than his own fucking son, mm-hmm. and that's the the real irony of this is that. Curtis Axel is the antithesis of what Kurt Henning is. Meanwhile, Dolph Ziggler is basically as close as we're going to get to the modern-day Kurt Henning. He bumps like Kurt Henning. His promos and his gimmick with the whole cockiness are similar to Kurt Henning. Not exactly the same, but there's more Kurt Henning in Dolph Ziggler than even though Michael McGillicuddy is a was at one point inside of Kurt Henning's you know ball sack, some point like you know thirty years ago, it, it, it's like such he's the opposite. Dolph is the guy who you almost he's almost too talented to fuck up, and it all it feels like and I don't know if you'll agree with me on this one, but it almost feels like to fuck him up you have to try to fuck him up well i think that's like, what we're talking about right like there's something that he did that is the cause of his current push unrelated to his work well i mean think about this this is a guy who i gave up on him as not as a wrestler but as like a pushed commodity i gave up on him the night that edge beat him for the title like 15 seconds after he won the title by getting speared like that with that kind of a burial right there i mean that's wcw level shit and anybody like you know that's like vince russo bischoff level bad you know what i mean you know how much i love my boy vinnie wow Roo, wow you actually said something negative about vinnie rue I said, no, the only reason why I say positive things about Vinny Rue is because everybody else says negative things, and I have to balance it, you know, because he's really not that bad. I what mean, a, really what about what Jim Cornette said about Vinny Rue, though, on the uh, MLW podcast? Well, yeah, but he hates, he hates Vince Russo. <laughs> He'll always hate Vince Russo. All right, so to... to no, to, but I, I just want to, I'm going to interrupt him, just finish my point. So it's almost like, okay, so this guy, right, Dolph. He went back and forth with Kofi Kingston for like two years, right? He's been buried on SmackDown. He was buried on Raw. And he was still, when he won the belt from Alberto the night after WrestleMania, he was so unbelievably hot to that crowd. This is a guy who they have purposely, and I believe they have purposely set out to kill. They don't want him over. And he just keeps getting over. And it's crazy because, and, and meanwhile, they want to, they actually give, they give this nobody, this Jay Brown, Joe Henning, Paul Heyman. Why couldn't Dolph get Paul Heyman? Like, it's such backward shit, dude. And about the match, well, I didn't even know they were having a match, man. <laughs> Dolph has to win, right? No, he's going to lose. Wait, Damian Sandow doesn't win either, though. I know, they're both losers, but Damien has the briefcase, which but, means that Dolph's going to win. You're right. Yeah, but, and I think they kind of like to start the show off with the babyface winning. But, okay, one thing. I, I, wanna just re, I, wanna, I just want to rebut one thing that you said. Now, let's say that Dolph Ziggler is not in WWE right now. Let's say that we don't have Mr. Perfect Jr. doing the same bumps and, and kind of you know walking around like Mr. Perfect did. Could then maybe Joe Hennig do some of the things that his dad did? Or do you think he is just devoid of all the genetics and all the DNA that his dad had? You weren't paying attention, were you? I don't care if they inject him with the genes of Howard Stern. Okay, I don't care if he gets an endorsement from... Michael Jackson brought back to life. Like, there, there's no way. There is nothing, nothing that can be done with Joe Henning. Nothing. He's, he is what he is, and he always will be. Nothing. Like I said, you could bring in the writing team from Breaking Bad. You could, you could freaking bring back Moses, 
who wrote the first five books of the Bible, and you're not going to be able to get him over. That's how, that is how devoid he is. He is, he doesn't, he's just, you know what, I'm going to do the old school uh, Leo Garibaldi phrase. Kid, you ain't got it. All right, well. Sorry. That that is uh, that is definitely a a harsh opinion, but uh, look, I don't look, I don't think he's a bad worker. I don't think he's a bad guy. He just doesn't have it, bro. I mean, when I look at him, he's a jabroni. Well, I, I think with some polish and with the right uh, the right idea behind him, I think he could be fine. He's not. He's never going to be a, a main eventer. I don't think that that I will agree with. All right, so I think Dolph's got to win this match too. I hope that. Uh, Something happens, you know. Maybe they, maybe they kick the show off in, in in a good way, and both of these guys get treated a little bit better. But but I mean, if they gave up on Dolph, then Sandow could totally win. Because I mean, here's the way I see it: if you're gonna give up on the guy, if you don't want him to get over, just have him lose to other people and get them over. You know what I mean? If you're gonna go this route, pro wrestling is so fucking immature, dude. Fucking 120 years of the history of wrestling, and. It's still about, we don't like you, we don't want to push you. It's never like, okay, this guy is getting popular, you know, the so-and-so, you know, only when there's competition. But whenever there's not competition, it's always, okay, well, he pissed somebody off, so we're going to make him lose. How many fucking actors, bro? Look at Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford is a known dick, bro. Everybody in the business says Harrison Ford's a dick, bro. Does that mean that we're going to have him die in the movie in the first five minutes? It's fucking stupid, bro, and that's the kind of shit you only get from pro wrestling. Stupid fucking, you know, just like just like the great Dutch Mantel said, and this is accurate as hell, I liked wrestling better when the marks were outside the dressing room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I agree with that. All right. AJ Lee and Brie Bella, nothing really much to say, though I will say that I did enjoy the Diva show. I thought the Diva show was tremendous. Like I, I, you know, it's not agreed. It, it wasn't a great overall television show, but for a fun reality TV show, I thought it was really good. It was better than Raw, I think. Oh, so here's here's another thing that came up in our conversation uh, after dinner while we were talking wrestling. Is Dave says that WWE should have immediately booked Tyson Kidd. And Jarrett in a, in a, in, a, in a feud on on television, and then I said, "Well, then the uh, the the writing crew for WWE would have screwed up the the storylines for for whatever's going to happen on on Divas because they're obviously uh, 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 not as good at at creating feuds and and, and storylines as the WWE Divas writing team is." You know what's funny? Um, there were a few years ago. When Steph took over creative and a lot of the internet community would bitch because, you know, well, they're bringing in Hollywood writers. They should only have pro wrestling people. I actually totally disagree with that, um, as we've learned. Because if you remember, like, okay, remember the, the like an 04, uh, 05, 06 when, you know, you and I were talking and Brian's site had not been up yet, so I was on PW Insider and, and you know, we were talking, you were took in the observers. And I remember how we would always hear stories of like, you know, the Hollywood writers and oh creative has nothing for you. And now that I don't, I don't know if you picked up on this, but now that all those guys from that era are gone, like Court Bauer and Alex Greenfield, now we find out through interviews that that was bullshit. That the the, the real story is that Laura Nitus wouldn't even tell him. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you picked up on that, but that's what's been going on now. That all this time we've been conditioned to to learn that the creative Hollywood writers were bad. And these are the same people who are writing shows like Beverly Hills 90210, which is one of your favorite shows, like Breaking Bad, which is a 10.0 rating. So if you've got these talented writers who obviously have talent and can write great storylines, why is it that when they step into that WWE environment, they fail or they get the blame or they never are able to write that compelling television? If you ask me... It's not the Hollywood writers. 
It's the people above the Hollywood writers. I mean, and that's and that's the big revelation I think that we've learned or that I've learned in the last couple of years. That anybody who says that the Hollywood writers is a bad idea, I disagree. I think that's a great idea, but the problem is people above them are the ones causing the issue. I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, I I will somewhat agree with that statement. I do think that the vehicle and the engine that uh is is sort of the the outline of of what these guys do like there's definitely it definitely seems like there are some flaws within that entire system um and and you know we both listen to court bauer and court always says that at the end of the day what everybody is writing is whatever makes vince mcmahon happy so you know, even then, you're you're sort of handicapped if your whole goal and what your what storytelling that you're doing is is to make Vince happy. So that in of itself is kind of uh, I I thought that was um, very revealing as far as, as how this thing works. But um, well, well, we knew that. But what was more revealing to me is the story that Jim Cornette and him told about John Laurinaitis. How you know they would call these guys up and say, "Creative has nothing for you." And Cor Bauer, and I believe Cor Bauer because Alex Reinfeld said the same thing. He's like, wait a minute. What do you mean we have nothing for him? We actually, we have all these plans we're about to pitch to Vince, so you're just lying to get the guy out of here. Like, you know, like, and if you think about it, right, as much as you want to knock Vince Russo, you never heard that when Russo was there. Because Russo always gave, and this is what Conan said, and I agree, whether you like it or not, he always gave everybody something to do. So creative has nothing for you, never applied. You know, and, and, and that's telling to me because when Russo was there, Jim Ross was the talent relations guy. So it wasn't like it was Johnny Ace who had an axe on him. It just it really pisses me off that the wrong people are getting the blame for the product being shitty. You know what I mean? Because I really don't think it's the, it's the Hollywood right. I mean, I'm sure that there's some that suck and there's some that are good. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, I'm not, I want to generalize, but the whole, you know, they should only hire people in wrestling, I disagree because a lot of those people have old ideas that don't work anymore. you got to have a forward-thinking mind. So that's it for my rant. All right. I, I will not rebut your, your Vince Russo thing, though I do believe it had more to do with JR than Vince Russo. But... Um, you yeah, I mean, you're right. You might be right about that. But um, the only way that I see Brie Bella winning this title is if the idea is for Daniel to win as well and for them to celebrate together in the ring, though that seems like a moment that would be better set on a larger pay-per-view than this one. So I'm yeah. gonna, I, I think AJ uh, keeps the belt here, though I think there could be um, maybe a, a little bit of a, of a rivalry with the Total Divas crew and AJ that gets extended. Like, they, they kind of started really hard on that, where AJ and the non-Total Divas were, were going at it. But it's my guess is that they could continue this this one for a little bit just because of how much more of a, of a presence Brie Bella has because of that show. And I think that, um, you know what's going to suck, though, if they decide to book like them getting a, a, a breakup? Uh, that's gonna suck, but um, no, I think that yeah, I think you're right. I think that the 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 I guess ending the 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 bookend of them, you know, walking out like together or whatever, right? like on top. That's a great idea. But you've also got Nikki and John Cena. So will we eventually see the mixed tag match between those two, <laughs> or will we see like a mixed? That'd be cool. I mean, they're not gonna do it, but Survivor Series. Um, Cena and Brian and the Bellas against two men and two women. That's the, that'll be a first time ever. I'd, I'd be down for that. Well, you mean like next year because Cena's gone. Yeah, next year. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, hypo- hypothetically. I'm just saying, like, there, there's lots of – see, that right there is, is booking that they haven't done yet that can be creative, whereas 3 versus 11, <laughs> also creative but not in a good way. All right, Punk and Ryback. This one, we saw it last year a couple different times when they had Ryback set up to win and they couldn't pull the trigger on him. And now we have the Ryback who is basically the um, – he is the pretty girl to Paul Heyman's um, – You know, uh, what, what would you call the way Paul Heyman is acting towards Ryback? Okay. No, not like no, that. No, he's gay. No, Bro, he's... not no. That's not what I mean. He's smitten. Paul Heyman is smitten with this guy who 
cares for him to shield him from the the, the terrible CM Punk. But they're kind of going too far with the gay thing. I mean, the first week with the little kiss. I mean, I thought it was hilarious. I'm not gonna lie. And uh, and then, but it seems like that's the direction that they're going in. Like the direction they're going in is Paul Heyman. It's not even a man crush because I have a man crush on several people. Doesn't mean I want to fuck them. When I look at Paul Heyman and this guy, I think he wants to sleep with this man. Uh, I think you would go pretty far with Dave Batista. No, that's not, no, that's your man crush, bro. That's not my man. You said that was your man crush. If I could find that blog, I would do it. No, my man crush is Matt Bourne. Oh, yeah. Well, he's not alive. He, I still have a crush on him, though. Um, all right, so uh, Punk and and Ryback, is, it, it still feels more like Punk versus Heyman. But I do expect Ryback to finally get his pay-per-view victory over CM Punk just because they have to continue establishing this storyline and Heyman may Heyman's probably involved Axel's probably involved but I do feel like Punk has to lose this match for anything to make sense whatsoever um I don't know because it seems like this is one of those uh bride back wins Punk gets the win back a hell in a cell so you know what I mean yeah no I I, I sort of agree with that because uh, because the, that talent pool, bro, that talent pool is so shallow, and it's fucked up because there's a lot of good guys in the company and developmental and whatnot. But that talent pool is so fucking shallow that it's almost like they have to do these feuds and always do them the same way. If you notice, it's like we're gonna do rematches on pay per view every single month. You know, last year we had Sheamus and Alberto four pay-per-views in a row. Like, it's just stuff that shows how shallow the talent pool is. And also, it's also creative because there's ways around this. Like, if you're a good booker, you know, like a Chris Kresge or even like a Paul Heyman, you know, you could come up with different kind of intermediate feuds and angles. And we'll talk about it when we do 30 for 30. Um, You know, it's kind of to, uh, you know, to, to spread things out. Like, for example... You could have had Punk win on Sunday. Then you could have had Rye, uh, Rye Black um, come in. Uh, 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 what the hell's his name again? Big E. There you go. Big E, instead of having him go to Raw and lose in a throwaway match, it's just, who, who fucking thought that was a good idea? Bring him in as the next Paul Heyman guy. Then you've got Rye Back and Rye Black together against CM Punk. Can CM Punk overcome these two gigantic muscular guys? And then when you bring in Brock, you've got three gigantic muscular guys. So you've pretty much got like the three most solidly gigantic people in the company um, together with Paul Heyman, I think that's a great idea. Um, and then you've got different, you know, matches you can do on different pay-per-views. You could even do like a Survivor Series match where it's, you know, right back, right black, then two other guys against a, a team that Punk has to put together. You know, there's all these different things they can do. Uh, actually, you know what it should be? It should be right back, the, um, Biggie, Cesaro, and Swagger. And they kind of have Heyman, like, do the old school 80s wrestling. You know, he pays off Jack's, or uh, uh, what's it, uh, Dutch. He gives Dutch money. Let me borrow your guys for a match. You know, you just all these things they could do, bro. I feel like that they don't even go back and watch, like, what they used to be to kind of pick up on these ideas. Like, there's, and I'm just coming up with this right off the dome right now. Like, you know, but we're going to see. I'm sorry, I don't mean to go off on a tangent. I'm doing that a lot today. But we, we um, we're going to see this feud continue. This is not a one pay-per-view feud, and that's another reason why I think buy rates are down. I think people are starting to pick up on the fact that a lot of these pay-per-views don't really have resolutions, whereas they should. All right, Del Rio and RVD, for some reason, it was made into a hardcore match. Does... It would make me think that because they made this a stipulation match, that RVD would win the championship here. Now... We both know that uh, he has been booked fairly horribly in the last uh, the last month. You had sent me something from a Pro Wrestling Insider, uh, PW Insider, that said that um, his contract was going to be up and they, he hadn't re-signed yet or whatever. And then Meltzer had had said that they, he thinks that they're sort of burying RVD uh, before the title match because they're kind of mad at him or whatever. Or maybe they just thought he would sign, you know, whatever. 
But it looks like RVD's schedule is going to be kind of in and out and maybe not consistent. So that leads me to believe that he does not win this title here unless they just want to give it back to Del Rio the very next day. You know, RVD and his uh, stunted title runs. But um, I, I can't think of another reason why this is a hardcore match. What we, what, you know, d- does the stipulation, do you think, mean that RVD wins here? No, no, absolutely not. I, I, absolutely not. A stipulation never means that one guy's going to win. But it's his Remember, stipulation, though. It's the, yeah, uh, but the extreme Undertaker lost, stipulation. Undertaker lost most buried alive matches and most casket matches. You know, that's, that's the irony of wrestling. You know, sometimes you lose what you're good at. Um, he's not going to win, bro. You're, everything you said, you pretty much said everything I was going to say before I said it. Yeah, he... He's on his way out the door for at least a little while. He's going to lose and then maybe come back, you know, January or whatever. Um, And you know what? He's a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier with the Daniel Bryan thing. You could bring in somebody for three months just to have Daniel Bryan beat me, you know, as as a temporary, you know, what do you call it? Like a, um, like a, 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 I guess like a sidetrack feud and then go back in. To, uh, you, know, mm-hmm. you know, if you want to, you know, this is a, a quick, quick preview for 30 for 30. But look at the booking between the Deadly Games Tournament and WrestleMania. Austin and Rock closed the Survivor Series 98 pay-per-view, Brawley, if you remember. That was your WrestleMania match. But did they go to that match right away? No. Austin had the feud with The Undertaker first in the, um, the Buried Alive match, and uh, Rock had the feud with Mick. And then Austin feuded with McMahon for a couple months. So you've got these sidetrack feuds that are temporary until you go back to the big, you know, the, the, the real feud. Do you, you know what I'm trying to say? I'm, I'm not, my vocabulary sucks right now, but that's what they should do. You know what I'm saying? No, I, I, I completely get it, and I think – that's where they may have failed in this Brian and Orton thing. But before we get to that match, let's talk about my favorite match on the card, Goldust and Cody. Yes. Goldie and Cody against The Shield, Roman Reigns, and Seth Rollins. Now, here's what's really dumb to me. Of all the guys to pin Roman Reigns, they picked Jey Uso. And now, I like Jey Uso. And I think Jay, I think the Usos in general are a good tag team. But they are kind of back and forth in, in, in how they're treated. And Roman Reigns was unpinned, and all of a sudden he gets pinned by Jey Uso in that match. So now he's not unpinned anymore, and it wasn't made important at all. So you have Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, The Shield. You know, I think we both sort of wish that they were a little bit stronger than just bodyguards for the new corporation. But still, I think uh, everything that they do is, is really good. And uh, I don't know, Goldust and Cody is kind of the perfect storyline. You got Big Dust in the corner, and the idea is that if they win this match, they will get to keep their jobs. But if they lose, Dusty will lose his job in NXT, and they will also never be allowed to wrestle in WWE ever again. I think the only thing that's lacking in this buildup— Is Dusty in the match, yes. No, 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 no. I don't think Dusty should have been in the match. I do. Because I, I just I yeah, I sort of worry about him in, in the age that, that he is. The thing that I the thing that I think is, is a little uh seems a little rushed is the fact that I don't think the average fan really knows what head trainer at NXT is. So you know, they, they could have they could have made that a little bit more prominent these last few weeks, but I kind of feel like they just made it up on Monday because they hadn't they did, really because t- he's not. Yeah. Well, I mean, in real life, he... he, he yeah, in real life, he's not. He's the fucking uh, the promo class teacher or whatever. Right, but he still works with those guys. So, I mean, they, they sort of gave him a fake job title. But again, it's like, you know, we we didn't really have any information as to why that, you know, that job is important to him or whatever. Like, it just kind of was thrown out there at the last minute. Like, I think you could have done it without that. And it could have just been about Cody and Dustin never working in WWE again or they get their jobs back. I think that was fine. I think that was kind of a throwaway thing that I, I didn't really like. But overall, I still think this is quality stuff. This is the best stuff that's been on Raw the last two or three weeks. And I do feel like Cody and Dustin win a really hot match with a great finish. 
I mean, my original plan was to do all three of them against all three Shield, and I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit disappointed. Now, I know that you don't want Dusty in there because he's old, but all Dusty has to do is stay in the corner, and then when he gets tagged in, and he starts doing the, I'm telling you right now, when he busts out that bionic elbow on all three of the Shield, I will be 11 years old all over again. <laughs> and and that's it. Like, all he had to do was just stay in the corner, get tagged in for one spot. Can you imagine, with how good Dean Ambrose is at selling, can you imagine Dean Ambrose taking the bionic elbow? I mean, that's just, that is a dream come true for pro wrestling fans. And you know what? That's a dream come true for Dean Ambrose, to take a bionic elbow from Big Dust. He's still going to take it. I know, no, you're you're right. He might still take it. You're right, you're right. But I think it would have been cooler on the marquee, you know, the Rhodes family, all three against all three Shield members. Like that's that's just perfect, you know. And uh, you know, you could add Cody and Dustin taking most of the bumps. Dusty wouldn't take any bumps. He'd just come in, do the bionic elbow, and then you know, um, maybe get maybe get clotheslined or just punched once and out of the ring, or maybe go out of the ring and brawl with Dean, like you know, not like fall, but just brawl with him on the outside. There's things they could have done, bro. They could have easily, with smoke and mirrors, put him in the match. But um, that being said, why would you? do a run-in from the crowd while wearing your makeup. That's what I want to know. And I, I was so happy when Dave brought this up recently because I thought I was the only one. I thought that was the stupidest thing, bro. Like, that's, that's just stupid pro wrestling is what that is. Well, I'll, t- I'll would- tell you why, that, I, that I, I wasn't mad at that. And the reason is is because I – so when, they've, when they reintroduced Goldust when he was facing Randy Orton – they did such a great job, right? That like that was like they they did packages and they did tons of stuff about him. Now, if they had the hindsight to think about this while they were doing this, they would have also showed him as Dustin Rhodes, the natural, yeah, fighting with his dad against the Million Dollar Man and Virgil. And fighting with Austin, dude. That, I mean, the biggest star ever, you know? So, but they would have been able to show him without the makeup and as Dustin. And, and, right, like against Austin with Steamboat, Barry Windham. They could have done that, and then they could have brought him without the face paint. But because they were so focused on that Gold Dust character, I thought they needed to bring him out as the Gold Dust character. Like, I don't think he. I think a lot of the fans would have been like, oh, what's the story with that guy? Like,. You know, it's still stupid. They would have, first of all, they would have recognized him. Second of all, let me tell you why I should be creative. If you're going to go that route, then why don't you put the gold makeup on Cody also? Now, hear me out. You do the gold makeup, and you do lines under his eyes like war paint. So what it becomes is you're taking the gold dust, and you're putting it on Cody saying, okay, this is war. That's the other way around this. What, you either what, what do the gold they, makeup on both or on neither. Show? What if they do that at the pay-per-view? I'm, I'm, oh, I'm fine with it, but they should have done that during the run-in. Because I don't put makeup on when I do a run-in. From the, I mean, I haven't done a run-in in years, but when I do my run-in, I don't wear makeup. You know what I'm saying? But the idea behind Gold Dust is that he always dresses like that. But that's not true. We all know that. I mean, we, everybody knows that, man. Let me quote Vince Russo. This is fake, bro. I mean, come on. I hate to break it to you, but you know, okay. nobody ever won a belt in this business. No, no, no. But if the idea is that Dustin Runnels, his greatest character ever, was Gold Dust, and you just introduced this guy back on TV. If you then take the face paint off of him without telling people why, I think they get confused. No, I don't. I think I don't think you give him enough credit because, bro, when I, bro, you don't run in from the crowd when you quote unquote don't work for the company wearing your gold dust makeup. That you know, at that point, cause what sells is people buying into it being real. When they see him without the makeup, oh shit, he's not. Playing anymore. This is not the Gold Dust character. Okay, so this does is Sting, the son does, of Dusty Rhodes. Okay, so pissed. so if Sting comes back, or if Sting comes to WWE and does a run in on the Undertaker, does he wear his makeup or does he not wear his makeup? 
I don't think he should do a run-in on The Undertaker. No, I'm just saying if he does. If Sting comes out, does a run-in from the crowd, does he wear his makeup? I say yes. If he is contracted, okay, if it's his first appearance, then yes. But that's because it's his first appearance. Um, if, if he's contracted in storyline, then and he's coming in from the crowd, then yes. Or if he's coming in from the rafters, which they probably won't do because of the Owen Hart thing, but let's just say hypothetically, then yes. But that's not the story I'm they're telling here, bro. The story I'm they're telling here is that these guys – are disgruntled employees who got screwed out of their job. Sting, unless the story, you can't use that, you can't use the Sting comparison because, first of all, Sting's never worked for WWE before, so he's never been screwed out of a job. Second of all, but did, the they, gimmick, did they fire Goldust? Well, they, they did. They did they hire I, Goldust? They, they, they fired, see, that's the other thing. Like they fired Dustin. Okay, well, what we're arguing about? is something that they themselves never even prepared for. So it's kind of silly to be like, oh, well, this is how they should have done it because they didn't prepare for it. I'm almost sure. Well, no, but it doesn't matter. Why would you put makeup on before you run into the crowd? That's okay. stupid. Okay. Should Legion of Doom wear their makeup if they were going to charge out of the crowd to beat somebody up? If they... We're telling the same story. It doesn't matter who it is. It's not the people. It's the story. The story is both of these guys got screwed. He's fighting for his father and for his little brother. Okay, but we didn't so know if, that when he ran in. Wait, what? We didn't know that when he ran in. What do you mean you didn't know that? He was with Cody and, and fighting for Dusty. What are you talking about? He didn't know that. But he – okay, if he was fighting for Dusty – he would have went after the big show, correct? Well, yes, and that's a great point. Actually, you make a very good point now because he should at some point do that. Um, you're right. You're absolutely right about that. Um, but that being said, it doesn't take away from the fact that if the storyline is that Dustin Runnels, whatever you want to call him, right, he used to be Gold Dust. He came back in the Gold Dust outfit because, like you said, people recognize him. But then he lost the match, and his little brother lost his job, and his dad got knocked out, not just because of the big show, but because of Triple H and because of Stephanie. I don't see the logic in putting makeup on your – I don't see the logic of in doing a run-in in gimmick when the storyline is that this is supposed to be, quote-unquote, real. This is supposed to be a real, you know, uh, situation with a family who's being broken apart by a corporation. At that point, there's no time to put makeup on and do the gold dust gimmick. At that point, we're fighting for the family. Plus, it would have made more sense because when he broke in, he was Dustin. So it's like I, I'm, I'm not going to – he shouldn't even cut the promo. I'm not going to be gold dust. This is not a gimmick. This is Dustin Rhodes, Dustin Runnels, and I'm fighting for my family. That's how you draw money, bro. You just fucking make it real. I hope he stutters. Man, <laughs> you know I'm right though. You know you, no, you, can't, you know I'm right. I, I don't disagree with you. You know if I was booking it, it would have been like that. It would have been better. I don't disagree with you, but I also don't think it's that big of a deal. It would just bother me. I mean, maybe like I said, I'm probably in the minority. It just it bothers me. You know, it's just if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna go, here's the thing. It's fucking WWE being stupid. If you're gonna go that route, just. Go all the way with it. Don't, like, half-ass it. Like, the thing with Dutch Mantel and the Mexicans. Just go farther with it. I mean, when you think about it, back in 04, JBL was doing more controversial stuff with immigration than fucking Dutch Mantel was. Like, just go for it. Don't just go half-ass. All right, so... In... So, yeah, this will be a great match. And, and by the way, seeing these guys team up is going to be awesome because I don't believe they've ever teamed up before. They they were rumored to to be actually having a match against each other last year. I know that's what Dustin wanted, and it didn't happen. But I'm sure it's a it's a, it's a pretty cool thing for them to be able to tag with their dad in the corner, and I'm sure it's pretty cool for Dusty. Okay, so yes. now Definitely. now let's talk about Daniel Bryan. And oh Dan wait, one more thing. Sorry, just one last thing. When Dusty came out on Raw last few weeks, and he cut that promo. It really makes me sad because it's like here we have a guy who is leaps and bounds above just about anybody in the business as far as cutting promos. I mean, there's a few guys, you know, you've got a few guys here and there, but 
I'm going to catch some heat probably from you. Well, maybe not from you. If you really understand what I'm about to say, I think you'll appreciate what I'm going to say. I feel that Dusty is a better promo than The Rock. That's the way I feel. Because Dusty does it all himself. He doesn't goof off. And he cuts promos that have legitimately put asses in seats. The Rock comes out, makes fun of guys, Rudy, Pooh, Cookie, Puss, and that stupid shit that got played out real fast. I think Dusty is an amazing – I mean, I, I'll fight this to the end. Dusty, I think, is a better promo than The Rock. And it makes me sad because – He's one of those guys, like a Matt Bourne, who represent the olden wait, days of wrestling. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, I could. <laughs> what? No, what? I, I think when you're as good of a promo as Dusty is, you could argue that he's the best promo of all time. And, and while someone may not agree with you, at least there's merit to what you're saying. So what, you, you do get what I'm saying about how he's better than The Rock. What does Matt Bourne born have to do with this entire conversation i'll tell you you interrupted me oh here's the point you've got these guys like your matt borns um I, i'm using him because that's like the running joke with me that i have a crush on him but <laughs> <laughs> I, I i get my gimmick bro trust me but like you've got these guys who are dying you know they're passing away you know jack briscoe you've got these guys from the olden days who knew who knew because like like dave Meltzer, you know i think one of the reasons why dave isn't as happy as he used to be is wait, because wait, wait. The, what do you mean? happy about wrestling <laughs> Yeah, because you know you can tell, bro. He's not as excited as he was, like you know, a few years ago. You could tell by his voice inflections when you listen to Observer Live. You can tell, you know. But 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 not all of wrestling, just WWE, because it's a different business. Like these guys from back in the day, right? These like you know, like your your Dory Funks, you know, all these guys. They knew how to draw money. They knew how to talk. They didn't need promo class. They didn't need you know a uh, writing team. They just knew, and everywhere they went to, they drew money. And that's why I say Matt Bourne. And it makes me sad because these guys are dying, man. You know, the art of wrestling, the true art form that is professional wrestling, the working, the showmanship, and the promos, they're going away, dude. And there's going to come a time, I hate to think about this, but there's going to come a time when these guys are all gone and we're left with, you know, turds that grew up on the Attitude Era and don't really know what real wrestling is. And and seeing Dusty come out there and and cut that kind of a promo, I mean, who talks like that, bro? Nobody. Nobody talks like that. And it's a shame, man. It really is that it's just a totally different business now. I don't even know what the – I'm going to call Russo now. I don't know what that is on Monday nights, but that's not wrestling. I think Dusty is awesome. I've always been a Dusty Rhodes fan. Um, I think it's, you know, it's based on what kind of taste you have as to whether you think he's better or The Rock is better or whatever. I, I liked his promo. It, it made me feel like uh, it was a little, you know, sort of retro and, and it made just the way that he talks. Whenever he talks, you know, you sort of get uh, a little bit of a retro feel. Um, the problem with this program is he is much better at doing those things than both of his sons are put together. So he, he overshadows them in a sense. And, uh, you know, I, that, that, that's, that's going to be the problem when you, you know, again, we're talking about the sons of, of pro wrestlers, um, and how they do not understand how to, how to book the book, these guys correctly. So, um, but I, 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 you know, you could argue Dusty's a better pro, a better uh, promo than the rock for sure. Like I, I, that, that's an arguable, you know, statement. It's not, untrue or it's not true but you know you it had definitely has merit based on what you uh you said you know back so if i said the miz was better than the rock then there would be no argument no nah, that that would be silly i wouldn't say that but no I, I was just kind of i mean i know we're doing a lot of tangents here i really don't mean to do that but um it just I, i'm just giving you kind of my thoughts for the past few months because we haven't done a show in two months but yeah when i see dusty right it just it makes me sad because you know you've got guys you know like the billy graham i mean he's been close to dying a few times and they're literally passing away and they're as as each one of them goes the business goes with them i mean you know ricky morton robert gibson they're still alive but they're gonna go and these are guys who i think you know need to i mean i don't want to say hire them for to train but 
it's just a different business, bro. Back then, these guys were businessmen. They would go in there, they'd work their mess, they'd draw the house, they'd get paid, then they'd move on to the next territory. It was all about being a business. Like Jay Z said, I'm a businessman, not a businessman, you know. So, um, but now the business is all about, you know, oh, well, we're WWE, we're the traveling circus. We're not, you know, it's not about like the one guy, you know, putting asses in seats. And it sucks, you know. That's, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, to me, the the WWE is just a television pro- product now. Like it's it's very much, uh, you know, for TV. But uh, we'll see. It's just not wrestling. It's not wrestling anymore. It's, uh, I think it's just it's just different. You got to be able to you got to be able to adapt to the differences and enjoy the things that are good, and then not enjoy the things that are bad. That's fine. Like, but you know, I can go back to 1984 or 1982. And look at things and go, wow, that was cool, and that sucked. I think it's always been like that. I agree, thirty for thirty. But no, I'm just, you know, it's just these the guys who are coming up now, like you know, Bruiser Brody, these guys who uh, who Dave talks about, these are Hall of Famers, you know, who you know, some of them have never even like Eduardo Carpentier. Like I've never <laughs> seen a match with him. <laughs> <It's> random, <laughs> okay, but like the, the, you know, we. I'm. I'm it's gonna suck but, when they when they're but, gone. But let me let me tell you something. That's what happens with everything. You could say the same thing about baseball. You know, baseball's even worse because you have all of these uh, these writers and reporters who romanticize about the past era and oh, it was so much better and. Mickey Mantle, oh my gosh, to watch Mickey Mantle run after a baseball, he was such a great athlete. And then, but what happens is, is when you do that, in a sense, you're downgrading the people who are around today. And if you can continually downgrade today's product, you're not, you're going to, you're going to be downgrading a lot of the good that happens. And And that's sort of, you know, what, what I fear about you know, just sort of rehashing the past, which is why I look at each era like their own and, and in sort of an unbiased way. Like, yeah, like, you know, Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper, like those were cool feuds. Like those like those bring back memories. But it doesn't mean that just because there was a Hulk Hogan and a Roddy Piper that John Cena versus Edge sucked or. No, it didn't. I agree with you. So I mean we have to we have to look at them, but you know I don't think there's anything wrong with looking back at at past wrestlers and past guys and going wow you know I wish it was like that more, but it's just based on taste you know I think I think a lot of people will say you know have their certain tastes like it'd be great you know it's going to be great when we talk to uh, to Draven because you know he's going to have his own thoughts like you know <clears throat> we talked about this on Thirty for Thirty in that a lot of times what happens is is it's basically what you grow up on as that kind of sort of defines what you like. Like, you yeah. know, when we were talking, you know, Jason. Like New Jack Swing. <laughs> Jason was, you know, right in like the 95, 96. And, and I look at that. Also, stuff. he likes pirates and, 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 and diesel. Well, I look at that stuff and I go, holy crap, that was so bad. But he looks at that stuff and goes, I got to watch Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart wrestle every Monday. And, you know. Bro. I have a buddy of mine who says JBL was a great champion. Think about that. Mm, he was a great he's character. Like, he's like 19. He's like 19. I don't know if he's a great champion. He's a great character, though. Uh, so, yeah, you know, we, that, that's, that's just going to happen. But, uh, but you have to evolve with the product as the product evolves, too, especially if you're – now, you know, fans have every right to say what they like and whether today sucks or not. But if you're looking at it from sort of like a – a journalistic sense or or you know if you want to write about it or whatever you kind of have to kind of go okay today is a different era and i have to look at it in an unbiased way sort of like that but you could still complain about what sucks because there's it's quite apparent there there are things that do not work that uh in today's wrestling and we talk about them but there are things that i do like you know i i love watching daniel bryan wrestle every week just it's awesome no, uh- no, there's things I like too. Like I love Sandow. Like that's the thing. The the, the guys like Dusty. Like Sandow, I think is like would have fit great in the '80s. I think he's like, he's perfect for that. Like I like there's certain I like Cody. I really like Cody a lot. Don't get me wrong, but when Dusty comes out and just you know commands that audience, it's like fuck, man. Like 
these guys, I mean, nobody really does that anymore. You know, like taste control of the crowd. I even Cena, I mean, Cena gets the reactions, but he doesn't hold the crowd in the palm of their hand. You know, we don't have a guy like that right now. Rock does that when he when he when he gets to do it. Yeah, you're right, you're right, but he's not full time. In a sense, and I remember Rock. I actually count Rock in with Dusty. Rock is the guy from the past. You know, I'm talking about guys now. But uh, at Punk, I think Punk does a pretty good job. Yeah, you're right. You know what? I stand corrected. Punk is the only guy. All right, so before before this becomes way longer than I ever thought, but then again, we, well, yeah, all, always, is, we always go long. Um, let's talk about the main event. So Brian and Orton, again, um, they haven't really— Is re- there a stipulation? None at all. They haven't really reached the, uh, the, the match that they had on Raw when Daniel Bryan finally beat Randy Orton. They haven't reached that quality yet. They need to. I think they really need to knock this one out of the park in order for the, uh, the the people to get their money's worth on this one. Can you – you love to put your booking hat on. Now, what would you possibly do here to further along this Daniel Bryan versus the corporation angle? It's tough, man. This is a tough one. You know what I fear? I'm going to say what I fear first. I really hope the big show doesn't turn – you mean become good guy? No, become bad guy. Oh, become officially. bad guy. Yeah, that's that's gonna bother me. Like that that's gonna bother me to the point where I'm. And that's one thing. Um, that big this big show storyline is so bad. I mean, it, it's just so terrible. I have a buddy of mine who used to love wrestling, and I'm not talking about just the editor. I mean, he actually watched well into the Cena era, and then he stopped. He came back recently because he heard about how hot it was after the Daniel Bryan thing, and he's a big fan of um, the Wyatts, and he loves the Shield, right? But when he looks at the Big Show stuff, he's like, this is terrible. Like, this is this is horrible stuff, and I'm like, and that's from an outsider, from a casual. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, he's not super casual, but he is, you know, he's not a hardcore. It's like, yeah, it does suck. It's horrible. Um, So I hope that doesn't happen. Um, I actually think that the finish, one of two things should happen. Number one, the big show could finally, and this uh, this is how you book it properly, because remember, pay-per-views are supposed to give you one of two things, satisfying finishes or a twist in the storyline that's been built up for a while. So I think, you know, the end of a story arc. So I think that the story arc on this pay-per-view should be that the big show finally snaps out of it. I think what they should do is this. Before the match begins, Triple H comes out and announces the special guest referee. No, I'm sorry. The special guest timekeeper will be Roman Reigns. The special guest enforcer will be Seth Rollins. And the special guest uh, timekeeper will be um, uh, uh, Dean Ambrose, right? So you do the match or whatever, and obviously Brian's getting screwed. Then at some point, uh, you do a ref bump or whatever, uh, and then Stephanie calls up the big show to hit Daniel Bryan, and uh, he finally, finally says, fuck it, knocks out all the shield. Then it becomes a real one-on-one match, and then from there you could do Daniel Bryan winning again, or you could have Orton win, and then they do the rematch at Hell in a Cell, and then blow it off. So, but you know that depending on how they want to go with the ending, you can do one of those two things. But I think that if you want to like make this a memorable show and not have it be another throwaway show, you have to have some kind of arc, and I think this is the arc they should do. I think they should have Big Show finally stand up for himself. Yeah, I really like that idea. Uh, I but I I would put the belt. So how on. about this? You should apply for creative, and then I'll just send you my ideas, and then we'll just do it that way. There's no way in hell I'd work for WWE ever in nah, my you, life. You probably, yeah, you probably would get treated like shit. Um, I, uh, I I like the idea. I think Brian needs to win, but I do think I would take the belt off him probably at TLC. Like I'd give him like two months or three months of of being a champ, and then somehow he gets screwed out of the title at TLC, and then they book towards him getting it back at WrestleMania. Um, I like. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'll ask you a question about that. Do you think that having Orton lose again is bad? I think that you're right, because I think Randy's the kind of guy who can come back from that. I think he's got that ability to come back from a loss. Yeah, as long as Triple H stopped burying him, I think he will. I think he's, 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 he's probably the best guy 
you know, you, you could argue for Punk, but I think Punk's a little banged up and his wrestling has suffered a little bit. You could argue Brian, but, uh, you know, his, his character is really taking off. But, I mean, you could argue that Randy Orton's the MVP right now. He's that good. Um, so he'll he'll totally bounce back. The thing, the only problem I have is in, in winning, in Daniel Bryan winning, is the only logical thing to happen is if Big Show was to turn, Stephanie would put Big Show in the match against Bryan and, and force him to f- beat him because he wants the title. With the title comes more money or whatever. And then. That's, but that's great. You just booked yourself like either a good Raw or a pay per view. No, no, but that's what I'm saying is that's what they would have to do. And then you have to be able to sell Big Show against Daniel Bryan as a as a main event feud, which I don't know if you can. Well, maybe not for every, but you could for a, for a Raw. So, or you could do uh, Bryan versus Big Show versus Orton. In fact, that's what they do. Okay, we do my finish right with the Big Show coming out. He turns or whatever, um, and then Bryan wins. Okay, next night on Raw, Stephanie comes out and brings out Big Show and says, you know. You uh, you shouldn't have done that, but since you know, but since you were so courageous, right? We, I think you've earned yourself a title shot tonight against Daniel Bryan. And then it's like, oh, so then during that match or whatever, they have a match, right? And the match has no finish because Orton comes out and basically. Orton, the Shield comes out and they lay out Daniel Bryan. Then Orton comes out and lays out the Big Show. And I'm talking about he lays him out. I'm talking about chair shot to the knee, gets him down on one knee, chair shot to the head, maybe even bring out the pipe. I'm talking about he has to hurt the Big Show just as bad as he did Miz. And then you could have Triple H and Seth come out and be like, what are you doing? You know, because they they want the big show to beat Daniel Bryan. They don't want him with the bell, right? And then Orton could say, this is what you wanted. This is what you wanted me to be. See what I'm saying? Because remember, they wanted him to go back to his old style. Yep. So he tells them that. He's like, this is what you wanted. So then you book the Hell in a Cell and you make it a triple threat. That's it. It's, it's that simple. I came up with that just now. <laughs> like right now. That, it's not hard. All right, so do you – okay, we believe that Brian should probably win the title so that they could move forward with stuff. Do you think he wins the title? Man, I don't know, man. Honestly, I really don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because, like – because you know how they are. They, they like that even Steven booking shit, you know, and, and they might give Randy the win here so that way Brian can win it back at Hell in a Cell. I just think that with the Hell in a Cell, if you do that triple threat that I'm talking about with the big show in there, I think it's a better idea because it's not the same match over again. It's actually a little bit of a different match. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we've only seen one triple threat Hell in a Cell match last or two years ago, and it wasn't too bad. And I'm not a big fan of three ways, but – I'm also not a big fan of doing the same match every month, you know, so, and by the way, a Survivor Series, they could even do, you know, Randy in the Shield versus, um, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Randy in the Shield versus Brian, Big Show, the, the primetime players, who, the primetime players, you mean the Usos, or the Usos, yeah, you're right, well, I was going to say the Miz, but I don't want him no, anywhere near the company, you. Because the Miz, the Miz is going to come back and want to get revenge on, on Randy. I mean, that's going to have to happen at some point. All right, so we just came up with something that actually not bad. Now, you know Not what, bad. You we know, came up with something that's better than they've done in years. You, you know what my fear is? That they're not going to do it? No, my fear is is that Triple H brings back uh, the referee. Well, you mean, well, you know what? That, that will work. Because then you've got the... Uh, You've got the um, the 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 ref. Well, he gets he gets bumped. Remember the the finish that he gets, he gets bumped. So, but, but with the idea that he's gonna fast count Randy. He, he, well, yeah, he's gonna fast count Brian. No, that he fast counts Brian this time. Yeah, that that could happen. That's gonna suck. That's gonna piss people off. Like you're right, that would piss lots of people off. Though, fuck, man. Yeah, that, 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 that's I my fear. That, huh? That's my fear. Yeah, and I, but you know what they should do with that? Like, your idea is not too bad, but what they should do with that is hold off on it until TLC. If you want them to drop the belt at TLC, you could do something where um, 
you do have Brian come out, or whatever, it could be the Rumble, right, whatever show, and then uh, Triple H goes, uh, unfortunately, we could, we could even pull this one out, unfortunately, um, Jimmy Cord, or well, who the fuck's the head referee there? I don't know, dude. Whoever, bro. Jack Doan. Jack Doan called in sick today. He's got the swine flu, so <laughs> we had to call somebody, and unfortunately, for one night only, you know, this is all like tongue-in-cheek. Scott Armstrong's going to referee the match. What? What? Why? And then you have him screw over uh, Brian. Uh, they should do that later, I think. But no. or, he co- or ref bump, and then he comes out to, to do the... To do the fast count again. I don't know. That's it. Yeah. No, that's it. You're right. That could work, too. You do the same thing where Big Show lays out the shield, where he comes out, turns. Then it's Randy and Cena one-on-one. I'm sorry, Randy and uh, and Brian one-on-one. Then uh, out comes the referee gets bombed. Then out comes the replacement, Armstrong. Yeah, and then, and then Randy, get, and then Randy gets, uh, gets uh, uh, I'm sorry, Brian gets screwed. Yeah, that works. That works, too. That works, too. I just like the idea of Randy going crazy the next night and beating up the Big Show and laying him out. Because I think, like, okay, again, it's all about, like, Good pro wrestling booking and storytelling. If you're going to have Randy lose to Brian on pay-per-view, the next night you should rehab him. You know, And that's, this is something they would do back in the day. If you notice, right, WCW the same thing. Whenever somebody lost on Sunday, they'd always get their win back the next day on Raw. Not against the same guy, though. So, like, when Rock would lose the next night on Raw, he'd beat, like, Rikishi or something, you know, just to get a win back. So, in this case... Randy could lose again, and then the next night on Raw, he lays out the big show, which to me, if they do it right, it's even more impressive than him laying out The Miz. Because you're laying out the 500-pound monster, you know, with a, uh, with a pipe or with a baseball bat or whatever weapon you want, and he just leaves them there and he stands over him. That's, that is more impressive than standing over a midget like Daniel Bryan. <clears throat> All right, so... Um... You know, if they actually get creative with the finish, then it may be something that will get people to turn into Monday as well. And that's that's almost more so the goal these days than, than anything else is, is the raw stuff. So, um, no, that's good. Uh, uh, I, we actually created some intrigue out of a pay-per-view that I had no interest in watching. So You can use the word genius if you want. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I don't see the, the good thing about you. I don't need to put you over. Because you do a good enough job putting yourself over. That's right. Like 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 the great ones like Dusty Rhodes and Matt Bourne. We know how to get over. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and there's the thing. Okay, uh, I got all this stuff. Like, and I'm not. I'm really not trying to be an egotist here, but I'm like this because I've watched pro wrestling for so long. Because I like to read a lot, and I've taken bits and pieces from all the great bookers, like the Jim Cornettes and the Paul Heymans and the Bill Watts. And I've taken the good part, even though it's small, of Vince Russo and put it all together. Because there is some good there, believe it or not. It's like Darth Vader, you know, there's some good in you. All right. Um, so that is that. We, we will not come back for the post game show of Battleground because I'm not going to be able to watch it, at least live. But. There, uh, there, there may be more shows down the line. You know, we have the Hell in the Cell, we have Survivor Series, then TLC. Gosh, there's only like three pay per views left after this one until the Royal Rumble all over again. That's crazy. Yeah, but we we've got we've got a lot of UFC, a lot of boxing. Um, I, you want to talk about that? No, no, no. We'll we'll save that. We'll save that for later. Um, but uh, but yeah, so there's there's a lot of good stuff coming up, and and like I said, I, I look to be having on doing, uh, hopefully this week as or, or I'm sorry, hopefully next week before the the Marquez versus Bradley fight, and then there's the Pacquiao fight as well that that we would that that I hope to talk to him about, and also the um, the premier Booker uh, John LaRocca. We 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 talked about the premier show that I went to. Uh oh, what the hell was that? Uh, it's my ringtone. Um, <laughs> he just popped me with that one. <laughs> of all the ringtones in the world, that's the last thing I expected you to have. Wait, did you hear what it said? It was. It was. It was it? Uh, it sounded like Slipknot. <laughs> no, 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 no. It is. Uh, the ringtone is Jim Harbaugh, who is the coach of the San Francisco 49ers, screaming out, "Who's got it better than us?" And then the team going. Nobody. 
I seriously thought like your ringtone would be like a clip from like Donna saying I choose nobody or whatever. I really expected that to be your ringtone. Actually, that's a good one. If I do find that, that'd be a good one. You mean Kelly saying I choose me? Um, I choose me. Thanks, thanks. But uh, yeah, I get my characters mixed up. We talked about premiere, and uh, I, I will have on John Larocca uh, before the next show. Just to talk about, you know, just the show. And then also, he's a big MMA fan. He's a big Bellator fan, big UFC fan. I I, I don't think he's too enamored with the current WWF product, but um, just to be able to... Ask him about his association with KRS-One. John LaRocca? (laughs) (laughs) I think that's Scott LaRocca, my bad. Yeah. Um, So... We'll we'll have some shows coming up, and but you know right right now the main project is the thirty for thirty. So we have a lot of work to do to get the rest of these sixteen of those things out there before next year's WrestleMania or right after next year's WrestleMania. So a lot of work to do with those. Those will continually keep coming out, and uh, when when we can, we will do the FGB radios as well. So um, you got anything coming up on Super Friends? No. I really don't. Like, I'm serious. I'm working on a big guest. You know who it is, but I yes. can't really talk about it because I don't want to jinx it. Um, but I actually have to do something else first, which I ordered on Amazon. Then I kind of gave it away. So I got that first and then move on with the big guest. But no, no, nothing big. Honestly, honestly, like, I'm with you. 30 for 30 is the biggest project we have going on, Super Friends, right now. Um, well, we are going to do that tournament with the best breasts in Hollywood, but that hasn't been polished yet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, that there's really not anything too super on super friends other than 30 for 30. I mean, I'm not trying to bury my site. There is content. Don't get me wrong. But right now I am really focused on getting that done. There's not any other, like, like I don't have the Illuminati guy coming back for a while. So there's, you know, it's just keep an eye out because things change every week. So you never know. You'd never know. What about Draven's cousin? Uh, we, oh, well, yeah, okay. Wow, I feel like a dick now. There is a show coming up with him. I forgot all about this. Yeah, there is a show coming up with Draven's cousin, and we're going to be examining, and this is a really good show. I, I, I'm not saying that because I was on it. Like, I'm very proud of the show. Um, we're going to be, we already taped it. It's going to be examining Abraham Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs, mm. um, which is deep stuff. You know, we're going to talk about, uh, and, and you know what? I actually believe in the hierarchy of needs. I think it's a great theory. I think it's accurate. And we're going to talk about it. And it, it's good because it really makes people. It's a very positive show because Maslow was very pro-humanistic. He thinks that human beings were all born good and that society makes us all fucked up. And we're going to get into that because it's a good good conversation, two-part episode. So that should be coming up uh, in the next few weeks. I did not know that Maslow's name was Abraham. Hmm. There you go. Well, you know about it, though, right? The whole pyramid. And... Uh-huh. It's true, though. I mean, it's true. You know, I tell my chick, you know, my chick often asks me, she's like, you know, when you're, because she, she's not too experienced, like, in people with alphas like me, but, you know, she's like, you know, when you lose your job, you're kind of a different guy. And I have to explain to her, I'm like, you know, it, it's not that I, you know, that I'm, that, that you're not important to me, but when I lose my job, I'm the kind of person who I have to find a job right away. And that's what I have to focus on. So I have to kind of, I had to kind of teach her because she's kind of immature. I had to kind of teach her, you know, how life is. I'm like, well, <laughs> wait, wait. Did you just call your girl immature on a something that's going to be out on the internet? She is. She knows. I call her that to her face. She knows. No, we're, we're very – look, we have a good relationship. We're actually pretty honest with each other, and, and that's good. Like, I'm very proud of that. Uh, she is immature, right? but she's getting better. I mean, not immature – okay, she's not immature in a bad way. She's just not too experienced, you know, with people like me, uh, you know. And so I had to explain to her. I'm like, look, you know, I'm not the same guy – like, I am the same guy, right? But I, but when I don't have a job, I'm not as like she thinks I'm not as loving. And I have to explain to her it's not that it's that I'm really focused on finding another job. So my priority is that. And then once I find another job and I'm able to earn income and eat, then I can focus on being this creative lover. Do, do you know what I'm saying here? Does that make any sense? Did you say be a creative lover? That's what I said. I'm, I'm giving away too much information here. This is not what we talk about on this show. By the way, you you should have uh, you should have studied psychology in in college. This this intrigues you possibly almost more than anything. It is. It is very intriguing, and I, 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 you're right. You're right about that. But but no, no, I, I, it's true. Like it, it's, I believe it because I mean I, I think, and I've talked about this before. I don't feel comfortable going out on dates if I'm broke. 
I know some people can do it, but I can't. Like, I have to have money, not just, and it's not because I want to attract gold diggers or because I want to, like, you know, be this guy, but I just feel more comfortable even going out having a job whereas not having one. And that's what the Abraham Maslow theory is, that, you know, the bottom one is breathing and sleeping and eating. The second one is income. And then the third one is intimacy. So you can't really appreciate the intimacy until you've got the other two. All righty. Well, there's your there's your um, your your little bit of knowledge for the day. Um, they need and, to pay for this show. Or they need to pay for that. <laughs> um, okay, so we will uh, we will the next time you will hear these voices is WrestleMania thirty for thirty, uh, WrestleMania fourteen, and then the switchover will happen with Brandon Draven. Um, but yeah, so we're done and uh, appreciate uh, you coming on and hanging out. And hopefully, we'll be able to do more of these down the line in the future. But uh, that's all for today. So we will uh, see you when we see you, I guess. For Big D. No, we didn't play the, the, the game. We're going to keep postponing the game. Yeah, we'll have to do that another time. So for Big D, I'm Double G. See you when you see you. Peace out.